Plasma genitalium is is the um, is the simplest known uh, truly living thing. Mycoplasma, although it's the simplest self-reproducing cell, it has 482 genes, and each of these genes has uh, um, over half a million letters worth of information. If we were to write out the information in the gene of even a mycoplasma, it would take me a huge book to put it in. Okay, so this is the simplest life, and that's supposed to have got here by time and chance in a primordial soup. Yet somehow this is like saying an explosion in a printing press produced uh, an encyclopedia. Everywhere we look in the physical universe, we see evidence of incredible complexity and design. This brings us to one inescapable question. Did it all happen by pure chance? Or is it the result of something or someone far greater? I'm Randall Pollard and I invite you to examine the evidence of the real world. If the Bible is right, then everything that exists was created as the result of the master plan in the mind of the all-powerful Creator. But if evolution is true, then everything that exists is the result of the Big Bang, and there is no need for God. But do the facts and evidences of our world really support evolution? Let's consider one of several really big scientific problems with the theory of evolution. Many times we are led to believe that there aren't any conflicts between science and evolution. In reality, it's just the opposite. Since those who teach evolution generally reject the Bible, our approach will be primarily from the standpoint of scientific evidence. Sometimes it is easy to accept the modern myth that science is never wrong, or at least that it is based solely on the facts, whereas the Bible is just a religious book and therefore not scientific. But science is anything but perfect. Science is really nothing more than the current interpretation of the accumulation of facts known in our day. That's why they have to constantly revise the science textbooks. What scientists emphasized with absolute certainty in the past may be completely false in the science of today. In reality, science doesn't speak. Scientists speak according to their interpretations of the facts that are known in our day. Sometimes they get it right, and sometimes they don't. The Bible, however, never errs and never changes. So instead of being afraid of science, we should examine it and use it for defending the truth. Today, we want to consider the first of the really big scientific problems with evolution, which is the lack of a mechanism. But before we begin, we really should define the word evolution. In its most common sense, the biological, evolution means a process by which life sprang from non-living matter and later developed by entirely natural means. This definition is from a professor of biochemistry, a PhD on the subject. The majority of Darwinists would agree with this. Note that the philosophy of evolution has two enormous mountains to climb. First, they must explain where the very first life came from, and secondly, they have the problem of explaining how each new species of organism gained the new additional genetic information in order to evolve. This second problem is our theme for today. Okay, the lack of a mechanism. What does that mean? Well, if we can't observe evolution happening today, 
then what convinces scientists that it happened in the past? And if it did happen in the past, what caused it to happen? If evolution is the fact that so many teachers and scientists say that it is, then they must either show it happening today or at least tell us what made it happen in the past. The truth is that they can't do either one. If you were to wake up one day and see that your pet dog was not feeling well, you would certainly want to find out why. What caused this? He didn't get ill without something causing it. And evolution, if it really happened, must have had a cause, a mechanism that caused what we can't observe going on today. In truth, what we observe happening today is the opposite of evolution. Extinction, species dying off, and not a single example of an organism or species in transition becoming something else. Let's consider this subject from the standpoint of three interesting facts. The first is the reality of genetic variation. Some try to say that the Bible and creationists don't believe in genetic variation. Others say that genetic variation is proof of evolution. They would call it microevolution. Both of these ideas are incorrect. No intelligent person denies the fact of genetic variation within a species, including man. If there wasn't any genetic variation, then all males would be a carbon copy of Adam, and all females would be a carbon copy of Eve. In Genesis 1, God emphasized that he created every plant, tree, bird, organism, and animal according to its kind, to the point that he repeated the phrase ten times. God also emphasized the connection between the seed and reproduction according to its kind. This is exactly what real scientists observe in the real world. Even though the Bible is not specifically a science textbook, it does not make mistakes when it deals with scientific topics. The man who discovered how genetic variation works was a monk, a creationist by the name of Gregory Mendel. He did many scientific experiments using peas to understand how characteristics are passed from parents to descendants. His revolutionary work was largely ignored in his time, in part because of all the emotion over Darwinism, and in part because Mendel rejected evolution on scientific grounds. Mendel's work was true science that became the basis of all modern genetics, while Darwin's theory was just speculation and unprovable assumptions.